Hello again, Steve Fentress here for the Strassenberg Planetarium at the Rochester Museum and Science Center. This week, our home galaxy. And to start, how do we even know we have a home galaxy? Here's a summer night, recreated with the free Stellarium software. The weather's clear, the moon has set, we're far from city lights and far from the lights people put on their barns out in the country, and we haven't looked at any white lights or cell phone screens for 15 minutes and we can see a hazy band of light stretching across the sky. Someone long ago thought it looked like milk spilled in a river and called it the Milky Way, or the galaxy, which is really a related word. Galactic, lactic, lactation, lactose, all related to milk. Cultures around the world have many beautiful interpretations. A celestial river, the road to heaven, some of the Aboriginal people of Australia give names to the irregular dark patches along the Milky Way. Probably the most famous one is the Emu, sketched here on this photograph by Alex Cherney on Astronomy Picture of the Day. Italian astronomer Galileo Galilei was one of the first astronomers to use a telescope to look at the sky. In his book, The Starry Messenger, from the year 1610, he reports what he saw when he pointed his scope at the Milky Way. I have observed the nature and the material of the Milky Way. With the aid of the telescope, this has been scrutinized so directly and with such ocular certainty that all the disputes which have vexed philosophers through so many ages have been resolved, and we are at last freed from wordy debates about it. The galaxy is, in fact, nothing but a congeries of innumerable stars grouped together in clusters. Upon whatever part of it the telescope is directed, a vast crowd of stars is immediately presented to view. Many of them are rather large and quite bright, while the number of smaller ones is quite beyond calculation. After Galileo, the telescopes, uh, telescopes got better. In 1781, William Herschel wondered what this concentrated band of stars was telling us. He said, let's suppose that all the stars are putting out about the same amount of light so that stars that look faint to us are far away and stars that look bright to us are closer. That assumption was later found to be wrong. Some of the brightest stars in our sky look bright to us even though they are far away because they're extremely powerful. Others look faint to us even though they are close because they are intrinsically dim. But Herschel had no way of knowing that in 1781. He assumed that on average the stars had the same intrinsic luminosity. Then he counted the number of stars seen in different parts of the sky. In areas where we see a lot of stars, he reasoned that we must be looking along a far distance past many stars. In areas where we see fewer stars, he figured our line of sight runs out of stars at a closer distance. He came up with a sketch of the shape of the universe, like a lens or a grindstone with the sun as just one star somewhere in the middle. That was 1781. Telescopes kept getting bigger and better and photography came along. In the early 1900s at Mount Wilson Observatory in Southern California, there was the world's biggest telescope at the time. Astronomer Harlow Shapley used that telescope to study globular star clusters. Here's possibly the most famous globular star cluster, M13 or Messier 13 in Hercules, visible with a telescope high in our evening sky at this time of year hundreds of thousands of stars clustered into a globe shape. Shapley measured the direction and estimated the distance of 93 of these globular clusters in the early 1900s, and he made charts. We can turn on globular clusters in Stellarium and see some of what he found. The globular clusters are mostly grouped in one part of the sky, a lot around that wide part of the southern Milky Way, and hardly any in the opposite direction. Shapley figured that the globular clusters were part of our galaxy and that they must be grouped around the center, so the center of our galaxy must be far away beyond those dark dust clouds we see hiding some of the Milky Way in our sky, and the Milky Way galaxy must, mu must be much larger than previously thought. That was 1914. Soon after that, we found evidence that the so-called spiral nebulae were other star systems shaped like wheels or lenses, at first called island universes, now called galaxies. 
we began to realize that our Milky Way galaxy is just one among countless other galaxies in a very large universe. But what is the shape of our galaxy? We can't see it clearly from where we live because of the dark dust clouds that hide most of the faraway stars. To travel outside our galaxy and look back, we'd have to go hundreds of thousands of light years, and we can't do that. Invisible light comes to the rescue. Radio waves can travel through dust clouds, so radio telescopes can see the whole galaxy. Hydrogen gas in space, of which there is a lot, naturally gives off radio waves with a, rave, with a wavelength of 21 centimeters. So, in the 1900s, radio telescopes were used to make the first maps of the shape of our galaxy by mapping the hydrogen clouds from their 21 centimeter radio emission. Here's a radio view of the Milky Way in our stellarium sky, a thin blind right in the center of the Milky Way. We are in a disk, and that's the edge of the disk going around us. Another form of invisible light is infrared light. Dust clouds in space give off certain wavelengths of infrared, and here's the sky as it would appear if our eyes could see infrared light. A view from an infrared space telescope called IRAS clearly showing dust in the disk of our Milky Way. A later infrared space telescope called Spitzer showed even more detail. Putting it all together, we have concluded that we live in a spiral galaxy with a disk of about half a trillion stars spanning over 100,000 light years. Some of our newest knowledge of the shape of our galaxy is coming from a European space telescope called Gaia, which has been in space since 2013. Gaia has mapped the precise coordinates and motions of 1.7 billion stars. That's big data. Here's a short video the European Space Agency put out just before Gaia was launched. Throughout history, astronomers from Hipparchus' time to the present day have looked to the stars to tell us something about the universe we inhabit and to understand how we got here.
The European Space Agency is about to launch Gaia, a dedicated astrometry satellite that will map a billion stars of our Milky Way, unlocking the structure and history of our galaxy. To do this, Gaia will look at the galaxy from an extremely stable orbit far away from the Earth's atmosphere around the Lagrange Point 2. To cover an area as large as possible with detailed precision, Gaia will scan the sky with two telescopes set at a 106.5 degree angle while at the same time gyrating on a tipped slant called a precession axis. By combining the spinning and the precession, the spacecraft is able to scan the full sky. Actually, more than one time. It is scanned something around 70 times in the full life of the spacecraft, which is five years. Gaia will have three instruments on board that will allow it to map the sky in unprecedented detail. An astrometric instrument will measure the position of stars, while a photometer will deduce the temperature and chemical composition of celestial objects by analysing their colour spectrum. And finally, a spectrometer will measure the speed at which objects are moving towards or away from us. It's the combination of all three measurements that will enable scientists to get a better understanding of the evolution of the Milky Way. Never before there is a kind of large survey, an homogeneous survey, like the Gaia will be. So um, uh, the combination of the properties of the stars plus the motion of the stars will tell us families of uh, stars uh, and make um, us to reconstruct the history of, of the galaxy. But the key point is this uh, large amount of data which has high accuracy in the positions and distances and motions. But it's not just the stars that Gaia will be mapping. Its data harvest will be of almost inconceivable size and is expected to contain the discovery of thousands of new celestial objects, including asteroids, comets and exoplanets, as well as stars of all ages. By far, most of the objects Gaia is going to detect are stars, because Gaia is optimized for stars. But we are also going to observe uh, solar system objects, we are also going to see extragalactic objects, and this will be a database which will be used by the scientists uh, worldwide when the Gaia data is made available for them. It's likely that the extent and precision of Gaia's measurements will make its findings the main reference for scientists for years to come. Almost all of the fields in astrophysics will be uh, affected or will be in some way um, uh, let us say, um, touched by the, by, the Gaia, by the Gaia observations. Gaia will help us delve into the archaeology of the Milky Way, helping us to understand the history, the formation, the evolution, and maybe even the origin of our own galaxy. Now the results of Gaia's measurements are coming in. Here's a panoramic view of our galaxy as we see it from our home inside based on Gaia star counts. This video clip shows how Gaia has measured the orbits of globular clusters and several small galaxies orbiting the center of our Milky Way. And here's a clip showing where Gaia found stars when looking toward the center of our galaxy. At the very center, the stars are concentrated in an elongated bar. So we now believe we live in a so-called barred spiral galaxy. Here's an example of another barred spiral galaxy photographed by the Hubble Space Telescope. Our Milky Way, we think, might look about like this if we could see it from the outside. Gaia has also found that the disk of stars in our galaxy is slightly warped and wobbling over millions of years. This could be caused by a collision with another galaxy in the past. 
and the Gaia data has been mined to find streams of stars that are moving more or less together through space, some of those might be the remains of galaxies that collided with us long ago. You may have heard that we're due to collide with our neighbor, the Andromeda Galaxy. The latest estimates say that will be a glancing blow about four and a half billion years from now. To finish up, let's go back to the sky as recreated by Stellarium. How can we see our home galaxy, the Milky Way, in our sky? The center of our galaxy, which makes a bulge in the band of the Milky Way, is far down south as seen from Rochester. In late June, it's highest above the horizon around 1 in the morning. A month later, it'll be highest around 2 hours earlier, around 11. But that part of the Milky Way is low in the sky and we don't always see it well. Another bright part of the Milky Way goes through the summer triangle, made of the stars Vega, Altair, and Deneb. This is high in the sky most of the night, most of the summer. It's at its very highest in late June about 3.30 in the morning, in late July about 1.30, in late August about 11.30. To see the Milky Way we need a dark sky, so don't expect to see it from Rochester or brightly lit suburbs. Also, check your calendar for the dates of the full moon and avoid the time roughly a week before and after that. Look at a time after the moon has set early in the evening or before it rises in the morning. If you happen to have binoculars, get them nicely focused so the stars look like points of light and not circles or commas, then scan through the Milky Way. You can rediscover what Galileo first saw over 400 years ago, countless other suns in our home galaxy. We look forward to seeing you in the Star Theater Dome just as soon as we can do that safely. In the meantime, thank you for watching and enjoy these beautiful summer nights.